Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have a very important and very serious topic to be talking about today. With me is Chris. Chris, tell us who we've got with us, who our important guest or guests are. Absolutely. Um, today we have Josef Lebkovic and his friend Natali, who's going to talk to us about his latest book. He's a survivor of numerous concentration camps and he's, his book Survivor, which details his experiences within the German concentration camp system. Josef Naftali, thank you so much for joining us. I think there's no use on hanging about. Let's just kick off with the first question. You weren't you weren't born in, in Krakow. You were born in uh, Jelshitsan. No, yeah. Exactly. So can you tell us a little bit about your life uh, before you moved to Kazimierzyn in Krakow? What was life like in the village, which is northeast of Krakow? It is not really a village. It was a... A, a commercial town uh, surrounded by villages. All the villagers used to bring their produce to that town. And in that town, they had a lot of manufacturers, a lot of craftsmen, all, all kind of ready-made goods that the villagers bought in that city, in that town. Um, there was about 18,000 Jews in that uh, in that uh, town. And there were not too many uh, uh, Christians, maybe maybe a thousand or so. And um, it was mostly like a Jewish a Jewish city. I, they had the Jewish uh, schools, Jewish organizations. As a child, I went to public school with local with Christians and um, we had some religious uh, teaching um, when it was some uh, Christian prayers or something we were excused to go out and we had also like a religious teacher for an hour or something I don't have very good rem memories about that because the gentle boys used to beat us up, the, the Jewish boys, you know. So, so, uh, but uh, from the that was just a short while in my life, and uh, we were taught uh, ta taught all kind of thing. The only thing that was left with me that I remember from that teaching is how to saw a button. Yeah, that's how to sew a button. A button. That's what remained with me the, the whole from the whole teaching. Yeah, and I and since I'm alone, my I lost my wife a few years ago, and sometimes it happened that I have to sew a button. So, when is your date of birth, and what was what was your family like? My date of birth, I never knew, and when I was at the concentration camps. In every camp that, that I that I came in, there was always some of the SS sitting at the desk and registering us. So we had to line up and said, what's your name? But what birds? I didn't know. And if I would say I don't know, I would get with it with a whip. So I whatever came to my mind. I say it's birthday. So I had a lot, a lot of birthdays. I did. Uh, I was born so many times. Uh, in Can I add something to this? Can you explain to us? I mean, I know why, because I've read your book. But can you explain to our listeners why you didn't know what your birthday was? I never had birthday parties. We didn't know about such thing. And I was very naive, very, very naive, a very naive boy did not realize what's going on in the world, had no idea, was playing with the boys. Um, we were interested just in, 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 with the boys to be, to, to be together, playing, talking, uh, uh, 
go to religious parties, but never did that occur to me about uh, birthday. I, I knew something about birthday, uh, some sort of a Jewish uh, memory day. So I, I I knew that I was born around that day that, that uh, by the Jewish calendar, but never knew until after the war. I wrote. I thought I was born in Krakow. I brought, brought to the municipality in Krakow. They couldn't find me. Then I said, "Let me try Zalushitz because we were living there for a short while. Um, we were living in Krakow originally, but my father bought a, a flour mill in, in the area. And then we decided we're going to move over there for a while. And then we came back to Krakow. So um, it's not much that I remember in my youth. Also that moving from, from one place to the other, in learning a little bit there and coming to the new place, I forgot about the learning from the old place. And when the new place, I, I started to learn. And then it came the war and there was so much trouble and so much worries and so much preoccupation that you did not think about studies. It was all lost by me. When it came to the forced laborers and the persecutions and taking parents away and incarcerating and then taking family members that never came back, we, it was like uh, I, I, I cannot explain like a broken life. That everything went upside down. Yeah, you know? in in a way, uh, it's hard to explain that feeling how it was. It was like. And I was very naive. I really didn't, I did not realize the seriousness of the situation. How old were you when the Nazis came to Krakow? 13, 13 years old. So you were very young then when they entered into Poland. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like in Kazimierz and Krakow when you lived there? We were living in the heart of the Jewish Kazimierz in Krakow on Ulica Szeroka. That was a typical Jewish settlement. Although the, all that square, whether you know it, if you were there or never or no, that is a big square. In all that square, that was full of religious buildings. It, it was synagogues. It was houses of study, yeshivot. There was all the, the rabbis, they had their followers all around there. When you pass by that street, you could hear the Talmud sound, the sounds of the Talmud everywhere, everywhere. It was very, very, very typical Jewish studies, synagogues here, synagogues there. It was enormous, enormous. And we very... We, we were practicing religious life. We lived, we lived a religious life until the war, until it was broken. And then it was, everything was dispersed and everybody was uh, on, a, on their own. And there was no, there was fear in every family. And when the Nazis came in, we started, it, it became unlivable in our area because they were patrolling there day and night, starting to shoot the people to push, starting to, to cut beards, a half a beard, cutting the, you know, the pair, the, the locks, the, the side lock, cutting one. They, they wanted to make the people look like clowns. And then they, you know, the 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 Hasidim, Hasidim, they have long coats. They started to cut a half a coat with the scissors. I have seen one thing that I don't talk about it because it's hard to believe. People cannot believe that could be possible. And that is the thing that I saw that a group of them came and they caught an older man, and one took out a lighter that you light cigarettes and lighted his beard. And the poor old man was screaming and crying and yelling. And those few SS standing around, ha, 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 such, 
such a beautiful thing. This is non-human. I cannot understand how those Nazi beasts could be so cruel. I have tried in doing those five years so many things. I'll just tell you one thing. Once we were, you know, we were always hungry, starving. We always hungry. We got a, a sixteen of our of our loaf of bread a day that we hardly uh, uh, could afford to eat it. We wanted to to hold it. We smelled to it. We we, we took a, a a crumb to. Anyways, um, we went once out of the camp to work. And we were walking like a distance to the to the place where we were working, and we passed the orchard. And I saw on the ground some tiny little apple that fall down. You know, you wouldn't look at them, but I have had such a craving for those little apples, so I didn't want to go out of the while we were walking from the line, because they would shoot me. So I waited until the SS men, and that, that there were quite a number of them accompanying us. Uh, when the SS men passed by me, I I spoke German and I, I I told them, "Would you allow me to pick up a, a little apple?" You know what he did? He took his rifle and gave me with his rifle. I I, 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 I hit me in in the shoulders. So I figured I figured how. What type of people are they? How could they be so cruel? They had families, no? They had wives, they had children. They, I imagine, I imagine that they love their children, they love their wife. How could they be so cruel to people? But apparently they were brainwashed and poisoned their minds, telling them that the Jews are a disease, a, a, a pest, we have to clean it up. And they believed it. And I, in my mind, I knew from my childish learning that the human being is, is created in the image of God. That's what the, 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 the Bible tells us. So I, as I, so I figured in my mind, how could a human being, an image of God, do that to, an, to another image of God? To another movie. So I, I remained with the question. I had that, that question in my mind and uh, no answer. So, following the invasion, did your family stay in Krakow? Yes, yes, sure. We were, we were living there for a while already. No, no, we were living there for a while until life became in, in, unlivable. Until they, they started, the, the persecution started to be so terrible. And then and, and we had to close up. We had, we had an, an uncle in, in another town called, called Novi Miasto. So he said, it's quiet here. So we figured we'll go there. So we took a boat on the Vistula at night. And, they, and he had to close the lights because it was in, illegal to move. And we, and we went down the Vistula to Novi Miasto. A whole night is scared, very, very, very worried. If we will be caught, we will be in big trouble. So we arrived there peacefully, and we went to that uh, uncle, and we lived there for a short while, maybe two, three weeks, maybe a month. My father went out uh, on, on the market, wanted to buy something to see it, if we can get something. There were a lot of shortages of everything. Anyway, he was beaten up by an assessment on the on the market, and we saw that it's no more quiet. So we went to Zalushitz. And we stayed in Zalushitz until they made Juden Rhein, means until they seized the city. And, and uh, okay, the, the, was was all uh, uh, screaming and yelling and then and, and nobody should go out nobody should uh, look through the windows i've got a question though because you end up then in jelshita and between that you end up in Pwashov, which at this time is not a concentration camp and you underline that in your book that when you end up there it's it's not been yet transformed into a concentration camp it's a labor camp 
no rules. So how do we get from from Jaushitsa to Pwashov? Okay. The Jaushitsa was seized. And, and then we got an order that six o'clock in the morning, everyone has to be out on the marketplace. You're allowed to take 10 kilos and close the doors. So we took 10 kilos, a whole night, a whole night, everybody was in fear. What do we, so we packed the whole night. In the morning at six o'clock, everybody was on the marketplace. Everybody has to sit down, nobody get up. We were sitting there for till from six o'clock, let's say till two o'clock, something. I did I don't remember, but after till afternoon. And afternoon everybody gets up and we go to the to the in Zalushit. To the to the train station, to the train, and the train couldn't take everybody. There was about eighteen thousand Jews. The te- the train couldn't take everybody, so they had trucks, and they took us to Miechuf. And in Miechuf, they took us to a tremendous field, a very big field, and everybody should sit down there. And while we sit down there, they went around and called out all the people. Pulled out from the crowd all the people, they took them away. And a little bit later, I don't remember time, but I remember hearing, and people said, they, they, they probably shot all those people. It came, the, we were sitting there on that field, Nightfall came, it became very chilly. A whole day, you can understand, we didn't have a bite or anything in, in our mouth. And came night and started to be chilly. And we sit on the grass and we feel the grass is moist. And every time more moist. And then we see we sitting in water. We were sitting a whole night in water till our till till the waist. Um, my father understood what happened because he was a milner. He knew that there is a dam chair somewhere there that that give the energy for a for for a factory or something. They opened that dam and they flooded us. So we were sitting in water, in cold, without anything, and that's how we passed the night. Morning came, uh, same thing. We're sitting there, sitting there till about noontime. Noontime, everybody up. So everybody goes up and everybody lines up. So there were lines, 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 lines. At the head of the line, there was one assessment. Now I, we know that he played the role of God. He was with a whip. And he either showed you right or left. Wherever he showed you, there was another, he has two assessments in the sides. So wherever he showed you, that guy give you a push not to go to the other direction, but to this direction. And we did not know what was right and what was left. My father and myself was to the left. And my whole family, my sibling and my mother, and we did such a terrible thing to my mother because my father, my, myself, we gave her our packages. We figured we men will be able to handle the situation, whatever it will be. But she, with the children, she had to carry all those things. Now we know it breaks my heart when I think about it. To the gas chambers. <laughs> At least she did she shouldn't have to, to carry all those heavy things. But anyway, that was the situation. So from that big group that we have about 18,000 or something, 17,250 went to the right and, and, uh, and 750 went to the left, something like that. I was among the 750 with my father and we started walking. They make us walk, walking in a dirty in a, in a dirty uh, road, very dusty, a whole night, walking, walking. We came to a place called Lishki, 
we, 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 they make us work in Lishki and swamps to put, to make the, like, uh, uh, channels and put in pipes. So we were standing again in the swamps till our waist. And my legs were bitten by little worms from the, 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 in the swamps. We walked there for about a week or two. And from that, they took us to Plashev. Plashev was a Jewish cemetery. So they came with big machines, earth movers, and destroyed all the thumbs, all the, the, the graves, all the, so there was a lot. I was walking be, be, behind those big machines and collecting the remains, bones, skulls, with a shovel. And on my left side, there was a man with a wheelbarrow. And I had to put all those remains on that wheelbarrow. And make the story short, it took a long time, a few, I don't know, a week or something, days after days after days, they cleaned up the whole cemetery called Yerozolimska. And it became a flat piece of land, no graves, no thumbs, nothing, nothing straight, leveled out beautifully and of that <laughs> place started building barracks. There were people, I, I was working on it, whatever they asked us to do. There were hundreds of us working, but there were engineers or architects, what, what they, uh, they ordered how to, how to do those, uh, that, those works. And from that work became a, a concentration camp, our labor camp, uh, Plashev. And it was, we walked there, where whatever they, they told us to do, we did. If, if we would make any opposition, uh, we, are, we are dead. So we listened, we obeyed in order to, to survive. And it was, you could survive, it was survivable. Until it came that commandant, Amon Gert. Then life became unlivable. That beast was not a human beast that was a, a, a angel of that he walked around beating up people he had two big dogs biting he one dog jumped he started yelling so the the dogs jumped on the people he jumped on me and i and i protected my face so it scratched my hand i still had the uh, Till till now, I still have some some little thing it could be noticed. Uh, life became impossible. He started beating, shooting people for nothing, for nothing, just because I have so many stories. It, 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 I can't go into details, but uh, one thing he passed by and he called out a man like two rows in front of me. The man was the name was Shlomo Spielman. Spielman. He called him out and he says, I cannot take a Jew so handsome looking. Took out his revolver and gave him a few bullets. It was, you know, you 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 felt that you are nothing. You, you any minute he, you could disappear. When you, you see that imbecile was life was terrible, terrible. From there he sent that to Vyelitsky. We worked in Vyelitsky was a little better in the salt mines. We we chopped uh, the salt mines, we loaded it on little little wagons and well, little wagons we put on the elevators, we brought it up, we we loaded the salt on on uh, on trucks. So it was a job, it was a little better, a little better. For a while we worked there. I had a, a case that I uh, I escaped from there because it was a opportunity, uh, a, a, a good moment. So I, I escaped, but it didn't help me. I had to smuggle myself back into because I went to many places, knocked at the door. I figured people will have 
some pity on me. They'll say, come on, little boy, uh, have something. I, I, it didn't happen. I, I didn't find uh, some good people. Anyway, so I was in the village car as long as they asked as long as they left up there, then back to Plashev. Just going back to Amon Gott, you mention in your book that at one point he had a gun pointed at your face. Could you tell our listeners about that? <laughs> okay. Uh, in his mind, I was dead. The, the, the story started like this. He always walked around with the chief of the Jewish policeman. His name was Kilevich. I was I was very hungry and I was looking at what, how can I get something extra? And one day I had the courage that Kilevich was a beast, just like the Nazis. He wanted to show that he could do better than them. So I took the courage one day and spoke to him and said, I will polish your boots, they'll shine like the sun. They were dirty, the boots. I said, okay, come in the morning before the siren, very early, and shine my boots. So I came, and I used to go there like, <laughs> I would go more, but uh, I couldn't take an advantage. So I went there, let's say, once, twice a week. And every time I went, I got something, got a piece of bread, got a little bit of soup, a little bit of this, a little bit. Anything was gold, was diamond, you know, it's anything. So he used to give me something. And he, to me, it was okay, it was fine. And he was always walking around. He was always on the left side of Amaget. One day... The German army, the German war machine needed iron. And around that Jewish cemetery uh, of Jerusalemska, that is now a, a concentration camp, there was very, very heavy iron bars all around that cemetery. And those heavy iron bars could not hold if there was not some big columns of bricks that were holding them from both sides. So they decided, so first of all, we had to, there were, there was a statistic, like thousands of tons of iron, a big, a big, big amount. But we have to, the, 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 to the, how we call it, to, the, to destroy that um, dismantle, Dismantle those big columns. They were bricks, square bricks, and big, big. So they put me, since I was a little, uh, I was very short. And, uh, I'm still short, but I was always short. Uh, so they put me up with a ladder on top of that column. And they, I, I had an order to chop out the bricks and, and leave them in its entirety, not the, the complete. So I did that. And there was always a man downstairs when I chopped the brick. I, I threw it down to him very gently. And he always caught it and he puts it in piles, bricks, piles of bricks. Amon get passed by when we were working. And you can imagine when people see him uh, we didn't work normally. The, 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 the fear and the, the, the nerves. Ner anyway, I chopped that brick nicely and throw it down to that man, and the man didn't catch it. So he called him, come here, come here. Took out his revolver, gave him a few bullets, and he walks out to, out to me and said, throw it down to me. So I chopped the brick and throw it down to him. And he didn't catch it either. Since he didn't catch it, it come down. So I had to come down. I, I blooded my knees. I blooded my hands. It was sharp, those bricks, you know, to come down there. I couldn't jump. I didn't. Came down, started yelling at me, and he takes out the, the revolver. And I, I, I saw myself 
gun. And then I didn't know what happened. But I walked up in the Riviere, in the, the, in the Jewish hospital, in the hospital of the camp. And I look at myself, everything hurts me. And I look at myself, I have bandages all over, and I try to take those bandages away, and I see cut skin open, open. And it hurts and hurts, and I didn't know what happened. Totally, a totally blocker. At a few days, they, they, they gave me free time from work. A free day, a few days later, I I got a little better. How do I know that I got a little better? Because I got hungry already. I got hungry, so I figured, let me go there and shine his boots. And I'll get something to... As when I knocked at the door and he opened the door, he gave a big scream. You're alive! So I look at him and I said, yes, I'm, I'm alive. Yeah. Do you know who saved your life? I said, I didn't understand what he's talking about. I said, no. I saved your life. So I, I said, <laughs> what happened? Do you remember you were working on the, 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 the do you remember throwing down bricks? He, the, the, he reminded me the whole thing. Do you remember throwing down a brick on to God and he good, didn't catch it and he asked it, yeah, slowly, slowly, I got it. So when you came down, he was ready to, I beat you up and you fainted and you fell on the, your face and he wanted to pull your gun and I tell him, he's dead, save your bullet. I saved your life. Then I heard the whole story. That 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 is the story that they pointed the gun and and I I didn't know what happened. So this was not your last experience with this man face to face. You face him post war. After the war, you face him again. I know we're jumping a little bit time wise, but please tell us about your experiences with him post war. I was looking everywhere for him. We traveled around in villages. We interviewed the family. We interviewed neighbors. We interviewed friends. We interviewed enemies. There was a lot of enemies against the Nazis in the population, the German population. Why were they enemies? Because in general, there were shortages in Germany for, for the population, wartime. But the SS had everything. They got every everything. Hitler gave them to be his very faithful animals, you know. So he gave them everything, and and they had everything. And the neighbors saw that, and then they became jealous, you know. When they become jealous, they become enemies. So we got a lot of information, but it didn't help us. We followed here and there and everywhere, and until I one day I decided. Let me go to the prison of war, P P W camp, and there where all the not where all the people, the all the, the soldiers, the the uh, yeah, when they, they gathered them, there were about twenty eight thousand to thirty thousand of them. So I said, I'm going to go through. I spent a few weeks there. They're talking to officers, talking to generals, talking to all kinds of things. Do you have everybody here? You hold a vision. Do you know everybody? Yeah, they're our people. Uh, the, the, uh, asking officers, do, do you know, is this your battalion? Is this your whatever, whatever it is? They know everybody. They know everybody. Until after a long time, somebody said, some of the officers said, yeah, we all, t we have somebody there that there is, was not in our in our command, um, where is he? Over there, over there. I went over there, and as I was walking, I recognized him. It was half of him. It wasn't the whole, I'm going to get that used to be, skinny and, and, and dirty, like a beggar, dressed in schmutters, dressed in the garbage, you know, like homeless people or something, lying there on the on the grass, on the on the dirt. I went, 
my blood was boiling in me and I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't help myself. But when I came to him, I said, give him a big kick and said, you big dog, get up. And I called him all those dirty names. He used to call a dirty Jude. And you dirty Nazi. I called him all the names that he used to call us. And I started punching him and started. I was there with other friends, one or two of my friends. And I gave him as much as I could, I just to cool my 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 temper, my heat that I was so heated, so hot against the, the, this. If I I cannot ex describe the moment when I saw, I said, "Is this him? This is, and I am the one that I could do to him all those things." It, that was, it, I can't, you know, it's hard to explain. Uh, when I saw him, I was shivering. I was full of fear. Here I'm beating him. I'm spitting in his face. And you don't get up. And when he get up, I give him so many punches. And the, the guy didn't do anything. And I was asking questions. Why, why, this, this, this. And he didn't open his mouth. He never opened his mouth. And then I had to go to the command and I said, this is a very important piece of witness. We have to put them in a secluded little cell. And I did. And I, I went twice or three times to that cell to talk to him and hoping to see maybe there was some remorse, but there wasn't. Nothing. I don't know if that it was or if it doesn't. It didn't open his mouth. No, I gave him punches and I gave him oh whatever. I I I I got reprimanded for that and I quit my job after that because I was not allowed to hit, to to beat up them. You know, so I I didn't care. <laughs> I I did what I had to do. Too right, you beat the shit out of that bastard. <laughs> And you also gave testimony in the trial against him. Yes, of course. Of course. And I point, pointed the finger. They wanted to know. Yeah, they wanted to know if, if it's him. Yeah, pointed the finger. That is that is the beast, I said. That is the, the, the animal. Animal, I said, is an honor to call him. Because yeah. you didn't just go and testify against among God. You testified against other people. Yeah, yeah, you also. With other yeah. people. Yeah, Julius Ludolf, uh, Heinz Müller. I forget the other names. They were very, very, uh, uh, very German names. I, I, You know, what? I want to forget the whole thing. Uh, for, for, a, for a long, long time, I didn't want to remember. I never, I, I didn't ever talk about it. I wanted to raise it from my mind that never happened such a thing because I figured if I will live with those memories and with all, with all that, I will never be a normal person. I wanted to have all that behind me. I wanted to forget it. I wanted to start a life, a normal life, uh, until my children the, uh, they grew up and they they. Uh, Said, so Daddy, you have to tell us, Daddy, 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 you have to tell us, Daddy, you have to write, Daddy, they have to talk. Daddy. All that they started bothering me until I started talking and I started writing because they said, if you're not going to tell us, we have, we'll never know. We must know. And then we must, we must know to tell our children. Anyway, so, and then I decided it is important to tell the story for the world. It is very important. Why? Why is it so important to tell the story? People should know what atrocities have happened in order that to fight, to do everything possible a human being, a being could do that never again should such a thing be happening. Because that was some, there was a lot of the, the Jews went through, a human being went through through a lot of different uh, difficult situations. But that Holocaust was something that never in the history of the world, something like this happened. To take, I'm talking from the Jewish point of view now, 
to take six million people. What you know what six million we're not talking about six people, not sixty, not six hundred, not six thousand, not six hundred thousand. Six million bo 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 building building factories of dead, building gas chambers, using railroads day and night, rolling with people to those dead factories. It's I think we have to talk that should never again happen such a thing in the world. I had all kinds of discussions with Germans, with politicians, with ambassadors, with the German. Uh, I had a discussion with the German minister that came to visit Israel. Uh, a big discussion. Uh, what, I asked him, what do you do towards never again? He answered me education. Then I had a big, big, big discussion about education. When I speak, people also tell me they have a message. What is your message for the people? I said education. Education, you know, that should never happen again. So then there came the big, big question. The German people were the most educated people in the world at the time. How come that that education, they, those educated people could sink so deep into the abyss with the, the educated people? What's really and, interesting, I'm, I'm just going to add this, most of the high-ranking Nazi officials had PhDs and were incredibly well, as you said, educated. So in your book, you mentioned more than just Plashov. What were the other concentration camps you were deported to? In Plashov, they loaded a big train and sent us to Auschwitz. We were that train in the hottest day of the summer for two days and two nights. And every minute, every few minutes, somebody else fell. They put us 160 men in a, in a kettle car. 160 men. You cannot breathe. You cannot put 60 men there to breathe. 160. After when they unlocked our kettle car, we, for my kettle car, we walked out 20. 140 were lying, lines, layers of people. I was on the top of the people. I touched, I touched the roof. So from every wagon, from every at cattle car, there was there was an average between 15 and 30 people that went out. So we were a few hundred people there, and we the first job we got was to clean the dead, to bring them to the crematoriums in Auschwitz. When I go there, I show the people the, that that, that uh, truck where, and then after that we had to clean the the trains, and then I was very much afraid because they were collecting all the youngsters, send them to Birkenau to the gas chambers, but luckily I was in a group that they need to do a certain job, so. Luckily, luckily, okay. And then after that, they took us to Birkenau. Apparently, the the engineer said that we have to dig trenches around Birkenau because the, it was moist the land, and the trenches would. Uh, so we, so I uh, there's pictures there when we in Birkenau. Uh, the, showing we digging the the, the channels though not the channels the the um, what is it? <laughs> anyway so I I'm there from there they didn't have much place for us we were there a short time and then they sent us to Mauthausen and Mauthausen was a terrible place again we worked there in the quarries. The 184 stairs, people that couldn't make it, the people felt it was hell. From there, they sent us to <clears throat> milk. Milk, we were doing all kinds of work, but in the Alp Mountains, we built it tunnels, tunnels. What were the tunnels for? Tunnels were to hide weaponry and ammunition against the Allied bombardments, you know, in the Alp Mountains. So we worked there, I think, in, in Melk. We were there for about maybe six months, seven months, something like that. 
And then they send us to Eben Zay. And in Eben Zay, they did the same thing. We did make tunnels. We rerun for the movie that we made. We rerun all those places. Uh, Rabbi Shev, he is the, the manager here, the, 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 the founder of the organization of JROOT. And he is very interested in, in, in making known the history of the Holocaust and so on and so forth. So we went there and we went to those tunnels. There was a lady at the entrance in a tunnel at a booth and wanted to sell me a ticket. I said, I am not buying any tickets to go in here. You have to thank me, but thank me that I made the tunnels that you have a job. That you said, anyways, was just uh, like uh, it's it's one of the things that I don't know if, if you know uh, in Auschwitz you need to pay to go to the toilet, um, you know, and often we're, if we're there with survivors, it's one of these ironic, almost like macabre, peculiar things. You know, charging ten zloty for a survivor to go to the toilet in Auschwitz. <laughs> um, just very quickly, only because uh, Joseph mentioned it, so I I'm sort of uh, I I produced the film. Um, Called the Survivor's Revenge about about Joseph's story, um, you know, and and the irony of that that even though it would appear that the revenge is catching uh, somebody like Amon Gur, but really the revenge is that are the positive messages that that uh, Joseph uh, puts out. I, I I put revenge. Revenge means to repair all the bad. Whatever was done bad, do good. That is the revenge. By doing good, just the opposite of them. I say to young couple, have a lot of children. We lost millions. We cannot afford to lose. We need more. We have to replace. So the revenge is just do good. How about only because, Alina, we started with, you were talking in Polish. So one of the questions I've asked Joseph many times is, is is there a, a lesson that that one of your parents gave you? That, that, I was going to say that because I actually yeah. made that in my notes. Exactly the same thing. Oh, I, love, I love this one. I love this. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember it myself, but it, but it's... oh, he he doesn't know what he cannot say it, but he's remembering something something that I inherited. My mother used to say always to ask. And my children know it. They, it, it this, this sentence, everybody, you know, be nice, be kind to people. You'll never lose. My daughter went with me uh, to Poland. And uh, <laughs> so they asked, somebody asked her, do you know, so do you know Poland? She said, you, oh, sure. Now, what do you know? So she said, my Krishna, she needs your trust. Yeah, that, one, that is our that. education. I want to say thank you to uh, Pan Yosef. So I'm doing it in the Polish way because I have to. Lefkovic, thank you so much for being able to speak with us. And thank you so much for the gentleman sitting next to you, Natali, who's done an amazing job helping us out. He it's is been... the, he is all, he's the whole everything. He the, creates the whole everything. Yeah, he's the honor. whole president. It's been an absolute honor. If there's honor. any important question that you bothers your mind or something, you're welcome. We can, we can, I, we can I, make I, another time. Yeah, We're happy to. I think I should just come out to Jerusalem. I think that would just make my life much more easier. Because, by the way, just before we finish, I've been and I love Israel and I had such an amazing time when I was there last. But just to wrap up, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an honor. And um, hopefully people will go out and read the book because this was just the tip of the iceberg and there is so much more to talk about. So thank you to you both. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. And for our listeners, Joseph's book, The Survivor, will be available in the History Hack online bookshop. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org 
forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.